right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Honest Offense. Uh, today, I have the honor of being joined by legal scholars and authors, Ronald Collins and David Scover. Uh, Ron and David are co-founders of the First Amendment Salon, which hosts a series of nonpartisan programs that aim to foster a dialogue about free expression in America. You can find the First Amendment Salons over at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education's website. Uh, I'll link to that in the show notes. They're great conversations. FIRE is a great organization. I highly recommend them. Uh, Ron has taught at several law schools. Most recently, he was at the University of Washington School of Law. Uh, from, 2000 to two, from 2002 to 2009, he was a scholar at the Museum's First Amendment Center. Uh, rest in peace to the museum. It's no longer with us. Uh, David is currently a professor at Seattle University School of Law, where he focuses on constitutional law and specifically the First Amendment. Ron and David are two of the foremost free speech experts in America. Together, they've co-authored a number of books. But today, we're here to talk about one in particular. It's The Trials of Lenny Bruce, which I'm holding here in my hands. Uh, it is a, and Ron has his copy as well. Great. David? I, it's okay. <laughs> no, that, that's okay. It, I'll, I'll be happy. But, yeah. uh, right, it's nice. a, <laughs> it's a fascinating book uh, about a fascinating person. I, I can't recommend this book highly enough. Again, I'll, I'll link to the Amazon link in the show notes for people to pick it up. I'm so excited to have Ron and David here today to dive into the book and talk about Lenny Bruce. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to start with just who Lenny Bruce was because a lot of people my age and, and younger, even people who are interested in comedy, might not have ever even heard of him. In fact, I've spoken to people who have never heard of Lenny Bruce. So can we just start with who he was and why he's worth writing a book about? Well, let me just start here. Um, uh, despite our age, he's before our time, right? So, uh, uh, you know, I, didn't, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to imply no, that. <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and, and so was Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> the, uh, so we didn't really grow up listening to Lenny Bruce. Uh, so, but I will say this about Bruce. I think one thing that all co comedians have in common, and this is a generalization, and generalizations are typically suspect, but I think this one is pretty close to the mark, and David might want to weigh in here. I think every comedian, in one way or another, holds Lenny Bruce in high regard. Uh, in Lenny's words, he paid the dues. He was the last comedian who was prosecuted for word crimes uh, in comedy clubs in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, um, and San Francisco. And that um, contribution to free speech and comedy is enormous. And uh, I think whether you're not uh, comedians from a prior generation or a contemporary one, they all knew uh, Lenny Bruce. Uh, and the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, you know, Lenny seems like every generation he reincarnates in one way or another uh, and, and shines anew to a new generation. So Lenny Bruce is to comedy um, almost what Hamilton or others are to um, the founding. He is a foundational figure in comedy. His comedy was not um, mother-in-law jokes um, it had social commentary, which was a part of it. Did he use colorful language? Yes. Could he be vulgar? Yes. Did he offend people? Yes. But the way he offended them wasn't so much the words he used. I mean, nobody at any of the clubs he ever performed at, nobody ever complained to the police about colorful language. What bothered people, um, was the fact that he was criticizing religion or the Pope or political figures or people who uh, were bigoted. And when he went after them with wild abandon, it got him in trouble. And so Let in a nutshell, a little um, about go ahead. Next to that. Um, originally, Lenny uh, came out of the Jewish burlesque tradition. Right. In his earliest years, he imitated the shtick routines of his own mother, uh, Sal Sally Marr. But it was in the Los Angeles region strip clubs, which he would call the toilets. I'm working the toilets, he would say. And they were really wild. Yeah, and, and, and wild that, places. Yeah, totally wild. And that's where he began to develop the style for, for which he became rightfully famous. 
Uh, when you say wild, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I have to ask, when you say wild, what does that mean? What was wild about them? It was wild in the sense that Bruce was entirely uninhibited. At one time, he urinated into uh, a, a, a knot hole in the floor as, as a protest for the way that the strippers were being treated. I mean, Lenny just had no bounds in, in this club, and it's there, these clubs, and it's there where he developed some of his most creative, brilliant, famous routines, including Las Vegas tits and ass. Uh, he, uh, two is a proposition, come as a verb. Um, let me see, psycho, uh, yeah, psycho, Pathia sexualis. These early, early uh, Bruce routines set the tone for the later uh, routines that got him into legal trouble. Uh, so Ron was referring to the degree to which he was attacking the um, religious authorities. Uh, for example, in Christ and Moses, he mocked the Pope. And he, <clears throat> excuse me, and he got into legal trouble for that in Chicago. He couldn't be constitutionally prosecuted for blasphemy, but really he was arrested for blasphemy nonetheless. It was his ideas that were concerning the authorities. And in New York, you know, months after Kennedy was assassinated, he uh, gave a routine called hauling ass to save her ass, which was uh, a mockery of Jacqueline Kennedy's reactions at the moment after her husband was shot. Um, and it's, again, constitutionally, he couldn't be prosecuted for seditious libel, but it really was the libeling of a public figure for which he was arrested uh, in, in, in New York. So as you see, Ron was quite right. It was his ideas, not his four, six, 10 letter words, which got him into trouble. But it was, but it, the charges of obscenity were the only ones that could be brought uh, against him. And those in, involved the four, six and 10 letter words. He's saying wild. I mean, any of these clubs that he performed at in the early fifties, they could have been called the libido lounge. I mean. Uh, prostitution, uh, snorting coke, you name it was going on in these places. A lot of them were in the San Fernando Valley, which in those days was the, literally the Wild West. I mean, it was tumbleweed and what have you, right? Something right out of the big Lubowski. But, but you know, he starts there, as David puts it, in the toilet joints, all right? But then as you get into the end of the 50s and into the early 60s, and then, you know, um, things change. And now, social commentary becomes an essential part of what Lenny Bruce does. And what was unique about him? Was he the only person who was really doing this social commentary comedy? Why is he the one that stands out from that era? Well, remember, I mean, you know, you think of early Dylan, 63, you know, and then the protest movement, mid and late 60s. We're talking late 50s, early 60s. I mean, this is way ahead of, of anybody, you know? So this is at a time when homosexuality uh, is still illegal, criminally illegal, all right? And he's doing skits about this, you know, um, uh, basically lauding homosexuality and criticizing those who prosecute it. Um, obscenity was completely different then. See, we've, in modern law, we have a difference between obscenity uh, on the one hand, all right, um, and uh, colorful language. Colorful language was a part of obscenity in those days. There hadn't been a, a separation uh, between the two. And so uh, it, it was, it gave the prosecutors an easy way to go after him because all they had to do is find a cocksucker or, you know, something like that in one of his routines and, and they can come after him. And, and he knew that. I mean, he would perform one of the wonderful things, and David chime in, we, we loved writing this book because one of the, one, and I can't tell you how many times we just fell down laughing as we were writing it. Because when you're writing about somebody who has thrown his fate to the wind, you know, like a Rolling Stone, a complete unknown, who, who does that, who's carefree in the freest sense, they do all sorts of crazy things, you know, that 
regular people wouldn't do, be afraid to do. Some of them flop, but others of them are really genius. And because of that, it was, it was real exciting watching Lenny Bruce do some of these things, some of which were very dangerous. I mean, he never, he wasn't afraid of the police busting his show by the end, and we'll get to that later, it would cost him. But his comedy, the other thing is he had routines and the routines, David mentioned one, Christ and Moses, which is, these were long routines, you know, and there was, it's kind of like comedy and storytelling put together. And I think that's what was different about Lenny Bruce. And I have to ask, because before we started recording, Ron and I were talking about some of the other projects you two are working on. Mm -hmm. As legal scholars, what is it that brought you to Lenny Bruce, this, this sick comedian is what they called him back in the day. What, what attracted you to this story and to him? Well, for some 25, 30 years now, Ron and I have been writing books and articles that operated at the intersection between law, particularly First Amendment law, and popular culture. In fact, our first book together, uh, The Death of Discourse, which is now available in second edition from Carolina Academic Press, uh, studied or, 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 or focused on the impact of our popular culture of television and internet, of advertising, of pornography, on the state of American discourse. Um, so one of our very good friends, Nadine Strawson, a professor at New York Law School and the former president of the American uh, Civil Liberties Union, um, was quite familiar with our work. And it was Nadine who suggested to us uh, that we look into a, a book project on Lenny Bruce. And she said to us, and I paraphrase, you know, with your interest in popular culture and the First Amendment, you guys would be the perfect candidates to write a book on the nature of Lenny Bruce's comedy and on the tragic history of his obscenity trials. So we took up Nadine's suggestion. And as we re researched more deeply into the subject, it became clear that we were uncovering an incredible legal story, one that really had not been told fully or accurately by any of the prior biographers of Lenny Bruce. I mean, his trials are really like no other in history. You know, it's a remarkable tale of a man who was the tragic figure who, um, whose trials involved more prosecutors, uh, enough to staff an entire state attorney's office. I think there were 12 or more, including Johnny Cochran, interestingly enough, enough defense lawyers to fill a small law firm, 23, including some very famous civil liberties lawyers like William Kunzler, right? Um, and more trial and appellate judges that, that, that have ever presided over a single body of free speech litigation, including at one time Thurgood Marshall, before he became a U.S. Supreme Court justice. And now, all, now Marshall, as a, he was sitting as a judge. Right, I, yeah, he was sitting as a judge. Yeah. Um, and all of this for misdemeanor, misdemeanor obscenity offenses. So, uh, so just let me jump in here if I can for a second, David. Yeah. Um, you know, in a sense, at that pinpoint in time, um, I mean, Nadine first sent us a book, a collection of uh, profiles of lawyers who'd argued First Amendment cases. And one of the profiles in there was one on Lenny Bruce. And, um, you know, in a sense, it's odd that we wrote the book in one sense, because uh, I'm rock and roll, David is opera, right? I'm sandals, he's penny loafers, right? So we're really kind of, and so for David to do kind of a lowbrow comedian, you know, it just, it doesn't fit with that Sondheim, you know, kind of persona that tracks his attention. But as David said in a previous book, uh, The Death of Discourse, we had spent a lot of time looking at popular culture and commercial culture. And I think once we did that, 
then uh, it became an easier sell. I mean, for example, when I was doing this today, but I, you know, I can't say that on day one as we were talking about this, he said, oh yeah, this is a lowbrow vulgar comedian that does toilet joints and I'd love to do it. You know, this sounds great. Um, this is better than publishing the Harvard Law Review. No, it didn't really happen that way. Uh, but as David said, as we got more and more involved, I mean, given our background, things jumped off the page to us that to the average person might not seem problematic. I mean, for example, in, um, I believe it was in San Francisco, the prosecution puts on his case and the judge is about to rule. Well, wait a minute, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this violates Magna Carta due process. You know, the defense hadn't even started, you know, um, or when Lenny Bruce is uh, in, in Chicago, uh, what we call the Ash Wednesday trial, and, you know, everybody has um, ashes on their head except the two Jews in the courtroom, Lenny and his lawyer. Um, and it, it was an omen of things to come. And then we saw all of these lawyers that were involved and it's just enormous. Or you have in New York a six month obscenity trial for a misdemeanor in, in a club in Greenwich Village after midnight. So, you know, as we were kind of going through all of this and, and then we saw some very prominent First Amendment lawyers who would, including a guy named Harry Calvin from Chicago. And in our world, these are, these are huge names. And so we saw these people involved in this case and we thought, God, this is a story waiting to be told. And incredibly, the Bruce story is virtually absent from the recorded history of the First Amendment. I mean, there's no famous Lenny Bruce case because not none of his cases went all the way up to the US Supreme Court. You know, had they, had they done so and had there been a ruling, absolutely, you know, Bruce would have been a, 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 a prominent uh, First Amendment case. But Bruce, even though he had become a cultural icon, in the world of the law, his life and legal struggles had been forgotten. And so Ron and I wrote the trials of Lenny Bruce to resurrect the memory of this great legal story. And I want to make sure it's clear that these obscenities that he was getting in trouble for, it wasn't like he was going to churches and trashing the Pope. It was his shows. It was a Lenny Bruce show that people were paying to see. And because of that, because he said the word cocksucker on stage, because he was trashing the church, trashing the Pope, the prosecutors would show up. They would have police show up to his shows and write down what he was saying so that they could then go and prosecute him. And I'm curious because you know, reading his biography, reading – your book, it doesn't seem like there was this big public outcry against Lenny. It was, it, it was for some reason, the state seemed like they wanted to go after him and to get him. Can you explain that? Why was it that, that he was so targeted? Well, there never was a public outcry to silence Lenny Bruce. Uh, Ron said as much earlier, uh, most members of the general public knew little or nothing about him except what they had read in the newspapers about his trials. Um, and obviously his fans, his diehard fans were not being offended. There was no cry uh, about his language from them. So it's clear that Bruce's prosecutions were the end result of something other than a general public outcry, right? And thus it is that our earlier comments become relevant, that though he was formally charged with obscenity, it really was the sum and substance of his ideas and, you know, the quote-unquote blasphemy for which he couldn't be charged in Christ and Moses, the quote-unquote seditious libel uh, for, for which he could not be charged in, in calling ass to save her ass, that it was the sum and substance of his ideas that were the uh, that were the targets of the prosecutors. There's one other thing, though, uh, lest we put too many halos uh, over <laughs> Lenny's head. He did uh, uh, hang around with a criminal element. Uh, and David and I said, uh, if Lenny Bruce were alive and we were writing our biography, then we would never let him in our house. I mean, he was a thief, all right? 
He did do drugs. He did do hard drugs. He did hang around with fences, people that stole stuff. And so he was on the police radar, all right? But they couldn't always bust him for those things, all right? I mean, I think there's a scene in the book where they break into a house and, you know, on the beach and, and they're, you know, doing everything under the sun. I mean, clearly illegal. So the police knew about this criminal element, you know, and when they could bust him on drugs or something, and they did, there's a famous photo of him being handcuffed and it's not from a comedy scene, it's from a drug bust. Um, so I think another reason was uh, that he offended, if you will, the establishment, but he also, he hung around with junkies and jazz men and low lives and all. I mean, he, he, he thrived on that. And I think it was that too that caught the attention of the police. His wife, Hot Honey Harlow, I mean, you know, they were doing drugs late into the night, early in the morning, would go and have breakfast at, you know, maybe seven in the morning and then collapse. So I think there was that side too. And they, there's a very significant thing that hasn't yet been said that ought to be and does explain why he eventually got into trouble. When he was playing the toilets, he wasn't getting into trouble. There were no police that could have shut him down there. It's when he started to become popular. It's when he started to be considered a comedian that, you know, that people of quality, people of class would go to watch. That's when the prosecutor started paying attention because now he wasn't playing. He was doing records. Yeah, he wasn't playing to the low life element anymore. He may have hung with the low life element, but he was playing to refined or distinguished uh, or, you know, uh, innocent college kids, right? And they had to be protected from his ideas and from his words. So we, we have to recognize that really there, did, there was a bit of class consciousness in the, in the timing of his um, prosecutions. And that it is when he crossed the line from the toilets to conventional establishment comedy clubs that he began to get into trouble. Just to put a little tail on that kite. Um, and by the way, this is how David and I work. You know, I mean, one of us will begin a sentence and the other will finish it or we'll fine tune it and come back and- Very true. How long have you been married? <laughs> oh, we, we, you know, I, I think that probably after 30 some years, people think we are, you know, but, but no, I am not his first wife. <laughs> Nor the second. No, uh, even the, uh, the thing is, is that there were two Lenny Bruce's, um, I mean, David has mentioned the toilet Lenny Bruce and we'll find, and there was the Lenny Bruce of the fantasy records. Right. I mean, that's Lenny with a little, little bit of edge. Right. Um, and then there's Lenny Boos, uninhibited, robust and wide open in the comedy clubs. And so um, the counterculture immediately caught on to his albums. And, and, you know, these fantasy records, I mean, they were a big record house and they were doing a number of, of uh, important um, uh, musicians. And so he was getting more and more attention. But if you wanted to see, you know, Lenny Bruce unplugged, as it were, uh, you know, you would go to the Whiskey or you'd go to the Gate of Morn, you know, or you'd go to the Troubadour. And part of the buzz, if you will, is there would be police in the audience. And, but it didn't, you know, I mean, Lenny Bruce would say, well, I went through, a whole, uh, went through the whole routine gentlemen and you know it was a clean routine and never once did I say cocksucker and everybody starts laughing and of course that means that the police have some way to to arrest him so as I said you know when you have somebody who throws their fate to the wind and they're basically they're a tragic figure you know like they're a Janice Joplin or a Lenny I mean a um, Jimi Hendrix type thing you, you just know that these people aren't going to grow old all right and, and that was with it with 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 Lenny and and uh I mean, he did have, a, really, he did have a drug issue. I mean, he, you know, he... And he died of an overdose. Died, right. At the end, it cost him. So, I mean, and it's not as if the police weren't aware of this. So I think that's part of, you know, if they couldn't get him on that, they could get him, send a couple of cops, send a couple of 
uh, 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 blue uh, uh, officers to a club, let them jot down a couple of words, and then they come to court, and as he said, they would do his routine. And he said they did a shitty job of it. <laughs> That's, I, that was one of my favorite things in the book is him talking about how he wanted to perform his act in court for the judge because they were butchering his, his, his whole entire act and he couldn't be judged properly without being able to give the act himself. Only Lenny Bruce. I mean, that's his mindset. I mean, it, it never occurred to the guy that if he did that, no judge, no judge would find this funny, right? No right. jury would find it funny, I mean, in that setting. To Lenny, what was, what was the purpose of his comedy? Was there a philosophy behind what he was doing or was he just, just speaking how he wanted to speak and, and let the cards fall where they may? Oh, there, there definitely was a philosophy. Um, awesome. In many, um, yeah, in quotes, in many of his routines- I'm ready the philosopher, come on, David. <laughs> in, in, in many of his routines, the character of language itself and whether or not it was truly dirty was the very point of his comedy. You know, he, he would ask quite reasonably, why are we allowed to perform sexual practices and yet not talk about them openly and honestly? You know, he used to argue, well, we should be able to say in the privacy of this club what we're allowed to do in the privacy of our bedroom. Moreover, Lenny had um, a belief, whether you think it's naive or not, that to use taboo words would diffuse them of their power to injure, to shock, to immobilize. Thus, his notorious routine, where he uses the N-word and all manner of opprobrious racial epithets, again, believing that the repetition of these words would essentially diffuse their power. So there, there really was you know, some thought behind the use of this language. In, in essence, Lenny himself defined his purpose when he said, I'm here to expose the lie. What he meant by that was to reveal the hypocrisy that underlay the establishment uh, forces of religion, of politics, and of sexual morality. Uh, Lenny the philosopher said, I'm here to expose the lie. Uh, Lenny the lowbrow said, I'm here to piss on the velvet. <laughs> you know, uh, so, you know, there was these two sides of him. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he, I will say this, uh, whatever talents he had as a comedian, social philosopher, um, he certainly lacked them as a legal scholar. His knowledge of the law, to say, to put it kindly, was pathetic, bizarre, and wildly out of tune uh, with the realities of the law. Uh, Lenny the lawyer is really uh, a very comical sort of thing. I mean, uh, and you know, we have, there's recordings, I mean, he recorded a lot of things. And in his recordings, there's one of him talking to Harry Kalman, a very prominent uh, First Amendment scholar, uh, now deceased at the University of Chicago. And, and you know, he's there talking to, uh, to Kalman, and I could just see Kalman thinking, my God, you know, what the fuck? How much longer am I gonna have to listen to this? You know, and he's trying to be, dip Kalman is trying to be diplomatic. So, you know, Lenny the lawyer is, is really, a part of his downfall, I think, is, is that he had, although, at this pinpoint in time, you know, late 50s, early 60s, it wasn't really clear that, the con that either the culture had quite caught up with him or that the Constitution had. And so they were really kind of testing the outer limits. There's the 1957 Roth case that you mentioned, the United States Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court says that obscenity isn't protected, whatever that is, but, but sex talk, certain types of sexual expression are protected. And so that, that divide had really not been worked out yet. And so, as David said earlier, the reason we don't Lenny, know about Lenny Bruce in law, you know, in terms of the law books, is because his case hadn't gone to the Supreme Court, but they were testing, if you will, the, the outer limits or the new frontiers, I guess would be, uh, of the law. 
And I think that's really what made a difference in, in this case. And it's also what allowed the New York prosecutor to secure a conviction against Lenny Bruce because there was enough play in the law that, oh sure, he might win in Chicago and he could win in Los Angeles and a jury would find him not guilty in San Francisco, all right? But in New York, when you had a much more seasoned prosecutor, Richard Q and, and the world, and he was out, I mean, he really, this man, his animus toward Lenny Bruce more than anything else really explains this kind of, he was hell bent on sending Lenny Bruce to jail and he succeeded, he, he got the conviction. And, and it, go ahead. No, no, please finish. The, although, although he did not succeed in bringing him to jail because Lenny- no, left, Lenny beat the rap, you know. Beat like, the rap, right. He, he, he left the jurisdiction and never returned to New York City. So part of what, you know, our and story- died. Yeah, and died, right. And part of our story is that he died a convicted man. Just a, a little, uh, we, we, we should talk a little bit about Richard Q, the New York prosecutor. Um, you know, it, it's, it's incredible. It's almost like something out of a Greek tragedy. I mean, the guy graduates from Harvard Law School. He is a public servant in the best sense of the word. He is not this malicious, demonic, evil person that a lot of folks have built him out to be. Although some of those words do apply when it comes to Lenny Bruce. But, you know, he was ahead of his time in terms of gender discrimination, consumer protection, and all of these issues that you would expect of an informed progressive DA. But his tragic flaw came with Lenny Bruce. He could not abide the things that Lenny Bruce would say about the Pope, the things that Lenny Bruce would say uh, about Jacqueline Kennedy. And he was determined. And I think at some point his ego got involved in this case. And when we wanted to interview him, and we felt, you know, two things. We didn't want to defame him because we thought without a doubt, this guy would sue us if we did. So we had to be careful. We had to make sure that we crossed all our T's and dotted all our I's, and we had to make sure we had the full story. And so we said to him, look, you know, we'd love to interview you. This guy, this fuck, wanted us to sign a contract, right? Which after we were done with the manuscript, he could go through the entire manuscript and delete anything he wanted. And I said, we said, no, that's not how we roll. We, no, we're not gonna do that. You know, well, I guess you're just not going to have my voice because we did a CD or my comments and you'd better be very careful because if anywhere along the line you file, you can expect a lawsuit from me. And so, I mean, David. And then the beauty is we were wrapping up all <laughs> of the research uh, and, um, and, and I'll explain what research meant. Uh, on the uh, on the CD, we were interviewing many many uh, important figures who had known Bruce, loved Bruce, or reflected deeply on Bruce. And now and, he often narrated the CD. Yeah, that came yeah. from. And, and yes, so we we interviewed these people. We recorded the interview, and we secured their permission to use bits of their interview on the CD. the 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 CD was almost wrapped. I mean, literally, almost a wrap. Um, the narration was done, our choices were picked, and then Ron gets a phone call from, and, and it comes out of the blue. I was there at the time, we were, we were working together on the book, and Ron comes in and says, you won't believe this. This guy says, you know, I know you're writing a book on Lenny Bruce, you might be interested in what I have. And Ron says, what do you have? He says, I have the original tapes that Lenny Bruce recorded in a suitcase. Briefcase. Created Brief. for the purpose, for the very purpose. He had a briefcase. He a briefcase, right. But inside was, a rec was recording equipment. And he had recorded the entire New York trial. 
So guess whose voice is on that tape, right? We arrange to use parts of his uh, tape. We call up, I know, our, our editor and we say, we say, oh my God, we can't believe this. This guy claims to have the trial tapes and he's going to send us, you know, he's going to send us examples, you know. And they, so they said, all right, we're putting a hold on this. Let's see what, what, what he gets. We, we identify several bits where Richard Q is incredibly sarcastically challenging and mocking the defense witnesses for Bruce. It, and his voice is just, I mean, it's vile how he sounds, right? He sounds so, so mean, so evil. And of course, we purchased those bits and they're in the CD. So in the long run, we got Richard's <laughs> voice. By the way, the, the, um, the, um, uh, the person who called us from Los Angeles, um, and I'm embarrassed to say right now, his name slips my mind and no doubt he'll watch this podcast. And uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll edit his name in. Take, take issue with it, uh, as well he should. Uh, I don't think he had the complete tapes, but he did have excerpts. Wow. And uh, when he played them and we heard Dick Q's voice, uh, because one of the things that Mr. Q had said to us, now deceased, was um, that, uh, well, I guess, gentlemen, you're not going to have Dick Q's, he was speaking in the third person, uh, voice on your CD. Uh, and he didn't think that the Lenny Bruce thing was uh, a big deal. You know, that this wasn't anything anybody should be, um, this wouldn't withstand the test of time. And Dick Q, when he died, there was an obit in the New York Times and I believe in the first or second paragraph, what it said is the guy who prosecuted Lenny Bruce. So meaning the irony is, by the way, when the book came out, there was a party thrown for us in New York uh, at, a, um, at a bar in New York. And much to our Richard surprise- did come. Pardon? Richard did not come. Richard Q did not no. come. Shocking. No, no. But, but you know, the thing is, is that we were fair brokers and we were more than willing to give him his side of the story. Uh, but he didn't. And so, you know, this comes up in the 11th hour and it really did um, make a difference for us to, you know, to have that uh, CD. And while David is talking, I just want to look up this gentleman's name because I, you really did help us out. And I, and I, I need, we need to acknowledge him. So talk I'm about yourselves, gentlemen, I'll just a moment. And, and two it. things. The famous Dorothy Kilgallen was called in defense uh, of Lenny. And he, uh, he attacked Dorothy Kilgallen on the stand in a ruthless way. Uh, one thing that Ron didn't mention is that Lenny Bruce came back to haunt him because Richard Q was going to run for DA. Oh, yes. Right? After, uh, you know, this is much later much, much later after Lenny Bruce has died. And the, and Nat Hentoff, who was a music critic and a columnist for the Village Voice, wrote four columns in four uh, issues, sequential issues, on Dick Q's persecution and prosecution of Lenny Bruce. And because of those columns, there, I mean, there really was nothing else that was critical about this guy, but because of those columns, he lost the election. And so, so Lenny Bruce, you know, haunted him and in a sense, got back. He got back after death. It came around. What had gone around came around and, and, and Q was, uh, was prevented from the job that he really wanted for the rest of his for his career. And I remember reading that in the book. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ron. I'm out in a special news alert. <laughs> Chuck Harder, oh, if you're listening, right. Chuck Harder, we remembered your name, right? So I... I Chuck he, Harder, we love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, he, he, he really, I mean, it was such a wonderful surprise, but go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I, I remember reading in the book that story about Q running for DA and, and Lenny coming back to haunt him. And I was surprised at how it, it actually, I don't think it was that long after Lenny died. I think it was maybe a decade after Lenny died that he was running That's for right. DA. That's right. And just how in that short amount of time, that trial was, was able to, to haunt him. Was it, and I, I guess, I guess maybe this is, similar to the question I asked earlier, do you, was it that the culture changed that much in a decade that prosecuting someone for a se- obscenity was enough to sink his career? Or, well, or was it- was, It wasn't, oh, so, it ahead, was Ron. because of persecution. Right. And the guy that led the charge was Nat Hentoff. I mean, Nat Hentoff, right in the Village Voice, went after him with a wild abandon. I mean, he really, he really went after him, story after story, hard hitting. and. Lenny had become, remember there'd been a movie and everything, Lenny had become this kind of color, counterculture, larger than life figure. In fact, that's why we uh, titled the, bo- the book, The Fall and Rise of an American Icon. You know, Lenny, I mean, death was his best publicity agent. I mean, after he dies, I mean, you know, toward the end, he was broke, he couldn't perform in any clubs, you know, uh, but then he dies and, and then the movie and what have you. So when Hentoff went after him, um, and at the time, uh, Hentoff, I forget, there was uh, one of the New York newspapers, it wasn't the Times, uh, uh, a, a reporter wanted to interview him. And in those days, I guess, when interviewing standards were different, they, um, uh, he, I think he had her over for dinner. And boy, just a few moments into the interview, she's all over him on Lenny Bruce, you know. And so the th- fact is, is that uh, Richard Q would have made, I think, a good uh, district attorney. I think he would have made a really good district attorney. I mean, I think if he were a district attorney uh, uh, now uh, that, or had, at, at the time, uh, a guy named Trump would have been in a lot of trouble even before he decided to run for president. But he had this tragic flaw, and the flaw was Lenny Bruce. And he didn't just prosecute him, he persecuted him. And then when Lenny Bruce dies and what have you, and one of the things that caught us about the book, I mean, about the, the story in New York, uh, is, is that he died a convicted criminal. Um, and that had he appealed, had he lived and appealed his case, like the owner of the Whiskey a Go-Go, it would have been reversed. He would have won. Uh, and so when we end the book, it's like, wow, this stigma of a crime, albeit a misdemeanor, but still a crime, was, was there. And I think that people like Hentoff and others could never forgive Dick Q for, for that. And by the way, we have an interesting story about what we went through with our publisher about you know, seeking a posthumous pardon. That's a, that's yet another story, which wasn't in, 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 in. I want to hear about that because that's, that was something that, you know, I, yeah, I read about later is that Lenny's crime, Lenny's conviction in New York was still on the books when you were writing this, even though, again, like you said, no one had been, no comedian had been tried for obscenity since Lenny Bruce. It's something we've kind of all agreed is a ridiculous crime, but however, 30, 50 years later, this crime's still on the book. So you realized this while you were researching the book. What was that process like? Just a little bit out there. Just please, little, please. No comedian performing in a comedy club. Okay. And George Carlin's routine, although he wasn't prosecuted, the routine appeared on the radio and uh, uh, ran into issues with the Federal Communications Commission and went up to the Supreme Court. Uh, but no comedian performing in a club. But in any event, um, David, do you want to talk about the sure, I'll talk about the posthumous pardon effort. Um, so Lenny dies, a convicted man, and the conviction stood until a campaign that Ron and I launched with the extraordinary lawyerly skill of Robert Cormervere, a First Amendment expert and a partner in Davis Wright Tremaine in Washington, D.C., who graciously represented us pro bono. Um, we petitioned New York's Governor Pataki to pardon Lenny Bruce posthumously for the criminal conviction that was obtained in contravention of the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of speech. That was our allegations. And that petition was granted on December 23rd, 2003, 
uh, a very fitting holiday gift for Lenny's fans, for First Amendment advocates, and certainly for the three of us. Let me just back up a little bit if I can. You know, it's not like you call up a law firm and say, we want somebody who specializes in posthumous pardons. <laughs> you know, that doesn't, doesn't exist, mm -hmm. right? The other thing is, is when you petition a governor, like in New York, for a posthumous pardon, they don't even have to respond, right? So when we did this, to some extent, it was a bit of a lark. You know, we just thought it's our way of howling at the wind. I mean, we, I didn't think, I won't speak for David, but I certainly didn't think the governor was going to say, oh, yeah, this is a great idea. You know, uh, let me, uh, you know, possibly pardon him. I mean, he's a Republican governor. What's in it for him? Uh, but when we did the press conference, it got a lot of attention. Uh, and we thought, okay, that's it. That's fine. Uh, end of story. And then, you know, we get this call uh, and we were really surprised. We were really, really surprised. And then it makes the front page of the New York Times. And then... Uh, oh, we... And then, uh, you know, gloriously, we became, we became the recipients of the First Amendment Award. The Hugh Hefner uh, First Amendment Award. Hugh Hefner First Amendment Award in 2004 for book publishing. Obviously, it was both... Bill uh, Maher was the co-recipient that year. Right. Right, that's correct. Uh, but we received the award in recognition both of our publication of the book, but certainly because of the um, posthumous pardon effort. Um, there we met Christy Hefner, uh, okay. Hugh's daughter. Uh, we did not see Hugh himself that evening, but fortunately we had been, um, Hugh graciously gave us the opportunity to interview him for the CD uh, and we visited him at the Playboy Mansion in Beverly Hills. Uh, that's where we met the man himself. Wow. In wine pajamas. In, in <laughs> of course. Silk, in his silk pajamas. <laughs> he was eloquent. He, he was forceful. He, uh, uh, he, he addressed, uh, I think, the, he addressed the, the importance of Lenny at a very high level of abstraction. Um, I, I, I found the conversation with him to be extremely intelligent and sim stimulating, and obviously excerpts from that interview were put on the CD as well. You know, that's part of it. It's part of the joy of this, and it was a lot of work, a lot of work. Oh. Uh, interviewing people, uh, you know, th those days we had, you know, these tapes that actually had tape, you know, and uh, we went to Las Vegas. Uh, George Carlin graciously agreed to let us interview him. Because uh, he, the, the night Lenny was busted in, New, in Chicago, um, uh, Carlin was also arrested because he refused to show the police his ID, and so they put him in the paddy wagon with Ray Bruce. But he graciously allowed us to interview him just about an hour and a half or two hours before he went on stage in Vegas, uh, gave us Compass tickets to, walk, tickets to watch him. I have to say, as with Hefner, unbelievably gracious man a humble man, a very learned man, a very witty man, and somebody completely committed to Lenny Bruce. I mean, just, I mean, uh, when we interviewed Margaret Cho um, at her hotel room, um, again, uh, another person who was a different generation, but very committed uh, to uh, the memory of Lenny Bruce. And so we actually considered, I think Ron and I considered Margaret Cho to be one of the contemporary Lenny Bruce's in the sense that her comedy is also um, uh, attacking political, sexual, uh, religious uh, institutions and with a healthy dose of vulgarity. Uh, she, she had a line which I which went on the CD that I thought was one of the most perfect um, expressions of the of the depth that the um, that all modern comedians owed to Lenny Bruce because certainly on his back they can they can perform as openly as they want, as, as honestly as they want, and in their own words, even if th those words are quote-unquote dirty words. Um, and 
fear no prosecution today, right? She said uh, something that I thought was very poignant. She said, I would, I, I, I would want, I, I want to be like Letty Bruce. I just don't want to end up like Letty Bruce. And I mean, there it is in, in spades, right? right? There it is. No one wants to be prosecuted like he did. No one wants to be a First Amendment victim like he was. But they want to be known for the kind of comedy that he performed and hopefully famous like he was. So, so uh, I just thought she captured it uh, in, in a beautiful way in that one sentence. Do you think, oh, sorry, please go ahead, Ron. No. I was gonna say, do you think it's possible to be like Lenny Bruce without ending up like Lenny Bruce? And Ron was saying, Lenny, you kind of needed this crazy guy to be able to go through what he went through. Uh, well, well I, obviously, you can't be identical to Lenny Bruce without being prosecuted. No. Well, well yes and no. Yes and no. So um, let me just uh, refine that a bit. Um, Lenny Bruce, uh, any comedian doing Lenny Bruce's routines in comedy clubs today, there's not a comedy club in the country that he'd be prosecuted for. And if he would, it wouldn't get past what we call a motion to dismiss. So that part is true. It is also true that Lenny Bruce could probably not perform on the vast majority of college campuses today. Uh, in one way or another, uh, he would offend liberals, he would offend conservatives, uh, and in this PC culture, uh, Lenny Bruce would, be, would pose a clear and present danger. There's no doubt about that at all. Uh, some of the routines that he performed, I can't imagine in campus uh, uh, allowing that or encouraging that. Not that there wouldn't be a First Amendment violation, certainly there would be, um, but uh, even Brandeis University, which is ironically, I say ironically because uh, it's where uh, uh, his papers are stored, not all of them, because we have the complete set of the trial transcripts and what have you, uh, which a fire has put up on their website. Uh, and and, and we, we did not sell those, we, we gave them. But um, Brandeis University, when they were having a, because um, uh, 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 Kitty Bruce had given her papers to Brandeis University, and they were going to have a, um, a conference on Lenny Bruce, and they actually wanted to censor uh, what was said. And we said, no, we're not going to have anything to do with this. Do you guys at all understand the irony? And they said, no, well, but we can't say these things on campus. And he said, well, then you're not going to have us be part of it. And, and the irony is, is that Brandeis, Louis Brandeis, is one of the great First Amendment heroes. So, uh, you know, as far as we were concerned, you know, the legacy continues. And it's not surprising because if you offend people, if you offend people, right? I mean, we wouldn't need the First Amendment if it didn't protect people who offend other people, right? right? I mean, if you just said things that everybody agreed with, we wouldn't need it, right? right. And so um, uh, Lenny Bruce, I think even to this day, remains an outlaw, which I think is exactly where he wants to be. I did want to mention one thing uh, and I, I can pause here for a second and, and da let David make a point, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about what happened with our publisher when the book came out and we wanted to talk about the idea, still an idea of doing a posthumous pardon. But David, in case you wanted to say anything, I didn't. Yes, I, I had something to put on as, a, again, the way Ron and I write, as a tail to what he was, uh, a, a tail on his kite. There's one other area, there's one other place that Ron didn't mention where Lenny Bruce could not be heard today. <laughs> and that is public television and public radio. Because of the FCC indecency regulations, uh, ironically, he could not be heard on public radio today. Uh, and so, it's, so the college campuses, I completely agree with Ron, but also public radio and television uh, would not allow him to come on if he were alive and do his routines with four, six, and 10 letter words. Yeah, uh, uh, David said public television. He, he, he also meant broadcast, broadcast. Oh, yeah. 
broadcast. So cable would be okay. Broadcast cable would be all right, but not. I, he's right. So our book is out. Now we're talking about you know with our publicity um, agent at uh, at Source Books, which was a great press, treated us really well, did a spectacular job. But the woman who was having publicity, that's another story. So. The book is coming out and we're starting to get all this publicity and we said, hey, you know, we've got this idea, right? Um, why don't we have this, launch this campaign to posthumously pardon Lenny Bruce, you know? It ties in with the book, it'll draw attention, you know, we can love. And this woman fought us tooth and nail, tooth and nail. This is terrible, this is a bad idea. This will distract from the book. This, you know, people will get interested in the pardon, but they won't have any interest in the book. All the news will be on the pardon, but none on the book. And we went back and forth and back and forth, and she'd made a number of other mistakes. And we were just beside ourselves, right? And David, do you remember what happened? Well, I mean, what happened is we dropped the posthumous pardon idea yeah. at the time. Wow. And there's no question but had we pursued that uh, and had the, you know, the governor granted the pardon as it did, that the book would fly off the shelves. Our, our book picked up in sales years later, right? Once the pardon effort was successful. So uh, I, I think in that particular instance, our marker uh, was way off base. <laughs> Yeah, and I think her tenure uh, ended. Uh, uh, well, let's not let's not speculate on on, on that round. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the jury is sir, we'll say the jury is admonished to strike that for the record, but not, <laughs> but not to strike yes, the person who put it in the record. Yes, yes, it is. Even right. if truth is a defense round. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, well, hey, yeah. I know I know we're running out of time here. So uh, before we go, I just wanted to ask, what project are you two working on right now? I was curious. All right, Ron, why don't you start and I'll- Yeah, we're, we're uh, in limbo as we're waiting to hear back uh, from uh, some editors and agents, but we've been working for a long time on um, a book on Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and his service in the Civil War. Uh, this is gonna be a high octane, um, uh, narrative, uh, Chancellorville, uh, Balls Bluff, Antietam, Fredericksburg. Um, and what this man experienced in those battles was just, um, and we're working with beyond description and we're working with civil war historians to help us. And it all ties into his view. There's a definite connection between what happened to Holmes in the civil war and his views on the first amendment. And so we first tell the big story the kind of action-packed story, and then link it to how it shaped his views of life and law. And I think we're a couple of years away. Uh, we've already done an enormous amount of research. Um, a book very, by the way, I don't think Oliver Wendell Holmes would have had much, he would have defended Lenny Bruce, but he would have had absolutely no interest in his comedy uh, at all. Uh, is it a fair assessment, David? He, he, no, no, absolutely not. He was too, he was a Boston blue blood, okay. and uh, th this would have been far too lowbrow for him. Uh, what, well, Ron what, thought it was too lowbrow for you, and, and he was wrong, so I don't know. Well, but if, if anything, I might be too lowbrow for Oliver Wendell Holmes, so now we understand the progression, right, the hierarchy. Um, while there have been many biographies, and there have, of Oliver Wendell Holmes, what's important about our approach uh, makes the book unique. Um, it's really the first and the only book that offers a dramatic, yet entirely factually accurate story of the entire arc of Holmes's remarkable Civil War experiences and then the impact that they had. First, in his overall perspective on the law, but more importantly, precisely on his First Amendment asp uh, vision of the law. His marketplace of ideas theory for defense of, um, uh, for, for First Amendment defense of dissident speech is, is precisely 
the competition, right? The competition of the stronger ideas over the weaker ones that he that he experienced in the competition of war of warfare during civil war. So he, he you know that that, that uh, those battles on the uh, on the field become battles in the marketplace of ideas. In the courtroom. I will just close on this note and, and let, let David have the final word, but uh, 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 apropos of nothing linear, and uh, as David knows, I go out of my way not to be linear, uh, and he's constantly, you know, calling me on it. But, uh, you know, having written now some three decades plus with David, uh, we are, in many respects, very different. Um, uh, and yet, uh, in fact, when you talked about lowbrow, my wife accuses me of bringing David down. You know, that, that before he met me, he was up, you know, he was highbrow and I brought him down uh, uh, to the gutter, but, but he brought me up. So this is, but you know, the thing is, is that despite our different personalities, like I said, he's Sondheim, I'm Jimi Hendrix. Um, we've managed over the years to uh, really build an excitement when we talk together, when we write together, when we write after we spend enormous amounts of research, David sits behind the uh, computer and I pace and I may start a sentence and he'll finish it or he may start it and I'll finish it. And we're much more efficient that way than we are when we're writing separately. And it's amazing how, um, I mean, we're so used to it now, but it's amazing how much in sync we are, uh, even when one corrects the other. Uh, the other, and then, you know, if he corrects me, I think, God, why did I not think of that, you know? And then when I correct him, I think, why didn't he think of that? You know? <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's really, in some respects, we're the odd couple, you know, in, in, you know um, uh, we also play on different sexual teams, uh, but uh, the... Uh, Outing me once again. Oh, uh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But it, it's, for me, it's just been a wonderful ride. And we've been through books like the Lenny Bruce book, like the Howell book, like the Farrell and Getty book. And then we've been, you know, articles in the Harvard Law Review and, and other very prestigious places. And, and we've kind of gone like the full spectrum. And, and for me, it's just been a wonderful ride. And I, I consider myself incredibly fortunate uh, that years ago, this guy, uh, in Seattle called me up and invited me to come and be a visiting professor at the law school. And, and it was the beginning of just a, a wonderful career uh, in, in writing and friendship with David. Thank you very much, Ron, for that. And I, I, I will say amen to what he said, because certainly um, uh, both, of, both of us, I think, have profited very, very much by a unique um, co-authorship relationship and a friendship that's, you know, irreplaceable. There's nothing like the friendship that I have with Ron. Um, but I, I will, I, to include you in this, Eric, this was a very exciting experience for us. And we thank you very much for having us, for discussing one of our passions, uh, our book on the trials of Lenny Bruce. And we hope when our Holmes book is released, you might invite us back to be interviewed once again. So thank you very much, Eric, for this first conversation with you. And Eric, if, if there's any mistakes, uh, our uh, lawyers will be in touch with you immediately. Uh, we will uh, we'll seek a restraining order. Uh, and we'll come after you for general damages and punitive damages for infliction of emotional distress. Uh, and uh, one of us has an uncle in Jersey who has a big Buick, which could be parked in front of your house. So I don't want you to be worried about anything, but just in case you screw us over, we know where you live. Listen, my family's Italians from Philly. I, I got my own people, so oh, we'll, no. we'll, we'll see. We'll Eric, see. Eric, you don't know it, but you just got our Lenny Bruce routine. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that was. I got thank you. you. Thank you so very much. So when, are, when are we gonna see this? Or, uh, I, it'll be aired oh, on Monday. Okay. So I'll close it out there. Uh, Ron Collins, David Scover, the, the book is the Trials of Lenny Bruce. Again, I'll link to all of this. Let me get it in the camera here. Available on Amazon and also in ebook form. Absolutely. And again, it's, it's a great read. It's a great story. Thank you for telling Lenny's story. I would love to speak with the two of you again on Oliver Wendell Holmes. He's one of my, my favorite legal minds. So we'll definitely do this again. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much.